Good afternoon and welcome to our panel conversation, Long-Term Care, Understanding Options and Advocacy. My name is Juliana Valencia and I am a Social Services Specialist with Fairfax Area Agency on Aging. Um, before we dive into today's topic, I want to quickly uh, provide um, a definition of family uh, or long-term care uh, in regards to this conversation. So long-term care involves a variety of services that are designed to meet a person's health care needs during a short or long period of time. Long-term care can be provided at home, which is commonly known as aging in place, or it can be provided in a facility, such as a nursing home or an assisted living facility. Although aging in place will be the best situation, we know that it is not always feasible because we just don't know how our loved ones care are going to change and are going to progress over the course of their illness. And their care needs might change and they may go beyond our capacity to help them. So caregiving can be very complex and overwhelming, especially for people who are still working, have full-time jobs, are raising a family, or even older adults who are at a higher risk of getting sick and dying before their loved one does. So the purpose of this conversation is really to provide you with information so that if you are ever considering this option for your loved one or yourself, you know what to look for, who to reach out, and most, most importantly, you will be making an informed decision rather than waiting for a crisis to happen and having to make that decision at that moment without prior information, without prior knowledge. So today's panel is going to offer an overview of some of the programs they manage followed by a brief Q&A before we open it to all of you, our audience, to submit your questions. Um, please make sure you use our question box on your panel. Um, a few housekeeping rules before I introduce our panelists. Today's presentation is being recorded. Um, a recording of this presentation is going to be sent out to all of you by early next week. Also, at the end of the presentation, there will be a quick survey Please take a moment to answer those questions because it really helps us provide topics that you are interested in. Now, I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, we have uh, three panelists with us today. Unfortunately, we won't be able to have Tavna Limash uh, from Adult Protective Services, but we do have Alison Fitch, who is an Adult Protective Services Supervisor in Fairfax. We have Kristen Lucia, who works with the Northern Virginia long-term care ambassment program. And we have Denise Pitts, who is an elder law attorney with Legal Services of Northern Virginia. So thank you to all of you for being here with us. And um, now we are going to let Alison lead us into this conversation. All right, hi everyone and good afternoon. Um, so just want to get started. I want to reiterate, I am with Adult Protective Services in Fairfax. I am housed in the South County office. Let me see if you can next slide. Perfect. Um, so again, my supervisor, Tavna Lamage, is not able to join us today, um, but I will be presenting with all of you today, and that is our contact information, and we can get that sent out to you if you do need to get in touch with us again. Next slide. So with Adult Protective Services, there are three main offices for us. So we are based in the South County office, which is where I am in, um, which is in the Alexandria area off of Route 1. There is our Annandale location off a of Little River Turnpike, and then our Fairfax building, the Panino building, um, which is close to Government Center. Perfect. So there are a couple ways to get in touch with Adult Protective Services. If you ever find yourself in a position or a situation where you do need to file a report with our office, um, you can either contact our local intake department, and those numbers are listed below, or the state hotline after hours. So if you were to perhaps be visiting someone in an area and you're not as familiar and you have a concern, um, you can always call the state hotline and they can determine jurisdiction. But if you know that you're visiting a loved one or someone in a facility or a neighbor in the community that is in Fairfax, you can always reach us on our main intake line at the 703-324-7450 number. But again, if there's a situation in the middle of the night or on a weekend, you can call the state hotline that is a 24-hour hotline number, which is provided below the 
832-3858. Just to let you know, for the local number for Fairfax, that number is, um, those calls are received Monday through Friday, 8 to 430. Um, and we have multiple staff on that line, so they will answer those calls and you will get connected to a live person. Next slide. So what is Adult Protective Services? We are a state and federally mandated program that requires um, the, that, is it, that it is in each locality, each county. And we investigate reports that are valid for any abuse, neglect, or exploitation for vulnerable adults. And so when we look at a report, we wanna look at some basic criteria, such as those listed below, to include is the adult 60 or older, or is the individual 18 to 59 with a incapacity? And we'll talk about incapacity a little bit later. That could be a physical incapacity, but also mental. Additionally, is this person living and identifiable? Um, are we able to locate them and connect with them so that we are able to ultimately provide them with services? And then is what's being reported, is that circumstance alleging abuse, neglect, or exploitation? And then when you call in that report, is it the right jurisdiction? So we would investigate reports. A valid report would be one where the incident occurred in Fairfax County or the person resides in Fairfax County. So if those four elements are met, then we can look into opening a case. So just some general statistics to kind of orient you to us. Um, so in fiscal year 2020, Fairfax APS received over 1300 reports for abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Majority of our cases are self-neglect allegations. We'll talk about that allegation type um, a little bit later, um, but that's really focusing on an individual who's not able to take care of themselves um, for one reason or the next, whether it's by choice or inability. And then 44% of those reports received were substantiated, meaning there was a concern, there was a need, and we are looking to address that need or that need has since resolved. And 81% of those reports are for individuals that were 60 or older. Majority of our clients, 57% um, were female and 43% were male. The goals of APS, we really have four main prongs that we want to achieve in working with an individual to stop the abuse, neglect, or exploitation that is occurring, and then also to see and address it in the most least restrictive way. Um, so we don't want to force services on somebody. We don't want to assume that if they're not taking care of themselves at home, that they instantly need to go into a facility. But there are instances where we do need to consider that and supporting the family and the individual in seeking that placement option. And so we ultimately want to put in in-home services that can preserve that in-home option. But if it is not possible and it is not appropriate, then we are going to look to support the family in arranging out of home placement, um, looking at more restrictive options, perhaps the individual needs a guardian or a conservator, um, or if we need to look at other emergency based services for that person um, and get them connected to those options. But ultimately we want to increase their independence, minimize the risk and really promote the independence as greatly as possible, um, but balancing also that safety too. So there are some limitations with APS. Um, some of you may be familiar with Child Protective Services, though we have some similarities with them, we also have a lot of differences. Um, the biggest is being that we cannot force services on an individual who is capacitated and refuses our assistance. Um, additionally, we don't have the ability to take people into custody. Um, so if we were to come into a hoarded home situation and be concerned about that individual and they present as capacitated and they say, I don't want your services, I don't want your help, we can't say too bad, you need to leave and vacate the property. We're gonna be looking at other alternatives and other options on how we can support that person. Medically, is there something going on that we can reach out to emergency services? Um, if we are concerned about the home environment, maybe we make a referral to code compliance as there's safety concerns and a fire hazard in that home. Um, so really looking at how we can other, otherwise support the person. And then additionally, we cannot investigate um, when the alleged victim is no longer at risk. So, you know, an example of that could be that the person is living with um, 
the abuser and they move away into a facility and they're no longer connected to that person. We're not going to be looking into that situation further if that issue is since resolved um, or if the client were to pass away um, during the time of the investigation as our main focus is to provide services and connect them to support services. And if we aren't able to do that, then we, we stop the investigation. We mentioned incapacity, um, so this is kind of considered into a couple of different spheres, but it really is looking at when an individual is considered to be incapacitated when there are impairments, and those could be things like a mental illness, um, an intellectual disability, a physical illness or disability, and a dementia or cognitive challenges. And what we really look at here when we think about incapacity is, you know, how does that inability impact their ability um, to live independently, but also looking at that piece of make, communicate, and carry out decisions, um, and that they have a full understanding of the consequence of those decisions. Um, somebody that chooses to not take their insulin, for example, um, they know that the risk could be that their sugar levels could be, you know, go really high or really low and could put them in an unsafe situation that could cause, you know, a seizure and they understand the risks of those choices, that if they elect not to take a certain medication, um, that they understand that risk. And if they don't, then we wanna look at what other protective measures can we put in place um, to support them. So again, a person is not incapacitated just because they make bad decisions. That is everyone's legal right. I always think of an example, it's not the perfect example, but um, you go to the all-you-can-eat buffet, you pay the price and you choose to get five plates of food and it's piled high. You knew that going in there, you had the option, you had the choice to choose to eat everything or have one plate or have two plates, but you chose to have five. And you know that if you have five, that could be a stomach ache, feel nauseous, but you knew the risk going in. And that's a bad decision that you probably ate to eat all the ice cream in the buffet or all the food there, but you had the right to make that decision. And so, Though it is a lighthearted example, it is just one to kind of highlight that we may make not the best choices, but there's a balance with incapacity. So we're looking for abuse, and I know that's something we're kind of focused on today as far as looking at long-term care facilities and being mindful of some of those things we should look out for at times. Um, abuse indicators, you know, could be injury to the body, um, some obvious things of more like an actual bruise, a broken bone, a fracture, um, but also seeing things of fear of a caregiver or fear of a family member. Um, maybe the resident, the individual, you know, starts to turn away from that care, this specific caregiver that comes in to see them, um, being fearful of that person. Um, if you see restraints, um, and that's something to be mindful of too, um, depending on the use and their purpose and the appropriateness of their existence for the resident. Um, bed sores is another one that we often do see um, that can be a sign of abuse as well as black eyes, um, just any kind of injury to the body. Neglect, we often see dehydration, malnutrition, Again, bed sores, um, that can be also a sign of neglect. Um, additionally, untreated medical issues, um, mental health issues if they're untreated or under-supported. Um, if you see the condition of the individual, um, maybe they're in a double diaper at a facility. Um, maybe they're in a extremely soiled diaper at a facility. Um, conditions of the space, if there's an infestation of insects or other pests. Um, again, the home space or the environment, if it is extremely cluttered, uh, if they don't have adequate access to food and other um, basic need items. So again, just as it is with soiled uh, diaper, soiled bedding. Indicators of financial exploitation. Um, so facilities, you may see a depleted bank account or that somebody's bill is um, really high and then it's not getting paid. Maybe there's a concern about that. Um, at times there may be concern about befriending staff, potentially befriending a resident and trying to um, build that relationship with them and ask for financial support. Um, fam families come with a variety of different dynamics. 
Um, so being mindful of adult children that may be um, trying to access those funds or adding themselves to an account. Um, looking at if there's changes in power of attorney or wills. Um, not that that is always an indicator, but if it is a rapid change or abrupt change and it's right, you know, when the person is in a vulnerable state, they may be taking advantage of that person to make decisions. Um, but really seeing, you know, finances spent outside of their normal spending pattern and habits, um, just kind of anything if they aren't getting the mail sent to them anymore or someone else has access to their checks. Sexual abuse indicators, again, looking at for any um, untreated medical conditions, if we're seeing an abrupt change in their sleep pattern, um, again, disturbed peer interactions, maybe they're extremely fearful of another individual, um, very guarded. Um, sometimes we see very uh, guarded or, or coded disclosures of sexual abuse, but at other times they're very direct. Um, so just really being mindful of that. If somebody is sharing that with you, you know, listen to that. And, um, you know, if they're in a facility reported to the, the um, managers there so that something can get started an investigation internally with them, but also reaching out um, to our office too and police if necessary too. So if you are in a position or you find yourself in a position where you need to reach out to our office, just some tips to be mindful of when filing a report. Um, and it's always helpful to kind of have that information readily available. But if you're calling about somebody, you know, we need to know their age and or date of birth, um, where they are residing or where this alleged incident occurred, who they are, their name, contact information for them and contact information for uh, involved parties, as well as if that person does have a power of attorney or a family member that is support um, or has knowledge of the incident or if there's staff that have knowledge of the incident. Um, sharing what information you have direct um, and the name and contact information for other staff persons. Um, if you know of general information as far as if they live with somebody else, if they have a roommate in that room, if there's concern about the roommate, if there are any safety concerns um, and who their responsible party is 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 it that they are responsible for themselves or that they have a guardian um, and then that we would ultimately look to connect with the client during the 8 to 4 30 hours so just providing us if you have that information where they may be um, and any other general information or if you know of any ways to engage with the person that's always very helpful too if there's somebody who sleeps until you know, 10.30 and I call them at eight o'clock in the morning, they're not gonna be very receptive to that phone call. So just any best engagement methods too. Okay, I'm glad I brought this up. If it didn't, I was. Um, with confidentiality, again, if you do make a report with us, we do wanna keep that information safe. Um, so it is confidential, that is uh, state law, federal law that we have to protect the reporter. If you call in a report, we cannot disclose who calls us. Um, and that information is, is only provided to us. We do not reveal it to others. Um, we've had clients ask us in the past. We've had people ask who called you and, you know, we just, we relay that we cannot disclose that information. Um, so we do, we do want those reports when there are concerns and we do want to protect the reporter's identity as well. Um, and so we don't want any, any concern of retaliation. So after your report, if you have that valid report, they live in Fairfax County, they're 60 plus or 18 to 59 with some type of incapacity, they, we have a way to contact them and locate them and there is a concern of abuse, then a worker gets assigned to that case and they will investigate that allegation. We have about 25 to, yeah, about 25 staff um, for the county. So we would investigate those allegations connecting with the client, connecting with family and other collaterals and other individuals that are involved, um, gather information, whether that's medical or otherwise, talking to facility staff, um, and really determine what, what went on, what services can we recommend if necessary, um, make a decision about the case. If they do need additional support, then we're going to look to connect into those support services. And then also um, we will send a notification letter to the reporter who contacted us as well as to the client or their responsible party to let them know of the outcome. And then if we are in a situation where the person is in need of services, then we would look to connect to 
connect them to those, and that could be a variety of things. Um, maybe they're not getting adequate health care, and so we connect them to a primary care doctor or other specialist um, to make sure that those needs are met. If it is a situation in housing and that they are living in the community and that's not the most appropriate placement, really working with them as well as their support system to get them connected to an appropriate setting, whether that's an assisted living facility or um, a nursing home, whatever may be the most appropriate. And then again, connecting them to their any other su social supports that could be um, counseling services or otherwise and legal services if necessary, if it's a situation where there's some criminal concerns, maybe connecting with law enforcement, but also probably connecting with Denise and her group um, for any other support in that way potentially too, and how to navigate that further. Um, our ultimate goal is to really reduce uh, and stop any future maltreatment. And then the biggest thing is working together. Um, anytime I do any type of mandated reporter training or talking about reporting to APS, um, the biggest takeaway for me is just go with your gut. If you're visiting with a loved one, a family member, or whomever, and you just have an, you have that concern, you feel it in your gut that something isn't right, I don't have to know, and that's that's the biggest thing is reach out to us. You don't have to know, you just have to have the concern and the suspicion. Um, so if that is the case, then definitely reach out to us. We do want to support um, older adults and vulnerable adults to the best that we can. Thank you, Alison, for that great overview. Um, now we are going to invite uh, Kristen, who is going to give us information about the Ombudsman program. Thank you so much, Juliana. Hi, everyone. So in the interest of time, I might skip over some of the slides I have today, but since the slides were sent out, I just wanted to make sure everyone has all of the information. So Long-Term Care Ombudsman is a resident-directed representative who advocates for the highest quality of life and care for individuals receiving long-term care services whether it be in an assisted living facility, nursing facility, or in-home care. The Ombudsman program is mandated in every state and a cornerstone of our program are residents' rights. We do site visits at all the licensed nursing and assisted living facilities in Fairfax, Arlington, Loudoun, and the city of Alexandria. So aging in place is best. When an individual is residing in the home, they may receive assistance from individuals in the community, such as their family, friends, volunteers, or neighbors. They may also hire an agency or private caregiver to assist. And there is a home-based care program through the county that can provide minimal assistance if income guidelines are met. And meal delivery services are also available through Meals on Wheels if criteria is met. If someone meets a nursing level of care, but wants to remain in the home, then they could be screened by a social worker to see if they meet functional criteria for the Medicaid waiver in the home. You can go to the next slide. So we cover currently 132 facilities in the different jurisdictions. And this number fluctuates if a facility closes or as new facilities open. We are seeing a lot of new facilities open, specifically assisted living facilities. And when looking for a facility, consider the individual's level of care and if they are an assisted living level of care or nursing level of care. Also consider the individual's preferences or specialized needs. So for example, are they a social person? Will activities be particularly important to them? Things like that. The location of the facility is important if there's family members who are going to be visiting often. And then also the payer source. So if an auxiliary grant bed or Medicaid bed is needed, make sure the facility accepts this and has an available bed. You can go to the next slide. So assisted living facilities vary in size. They may be as small as four residents in a single family home setting or a much larger assisted living facility in a multi-story building. This again comes down to preferences in terms of the size of the facility. Assisted living facilities are designed for individuals who cannot function in an independent living environment but do not need nursing care daily. 
The level of care they can provide may depend on the facility and an individual's need. Only some have a secure unit or memory care unit. You can go to the next slide. And the cost of assisted living facilities vary, but they range from 3,000 to 7,000 or go up to 10,000 a month. There is often a base cost and many have different levels of care and may charge extra for incontinence or other supplies and services. It is important to ensure the resident is assessed for the appropriate level of care during the assessment prior to placement. And it's also important to thoroughly review the contract. An individual may pay privately or if they have long-term care insurance, they can file a claim with their long-term care insurance provider. And then another option for assisted living facilities is the auxiliary grant. And one facility affiliated with the county is Lincolnian Assisted Living Facility, and it has auxiliary grant beds. And then there's also other privately owned facilities with auxiliary grant beds as well. And a list can be found online. You can go to the next slide. So a nursing facility will offer both short-term and long-term care. The care is often provided under the direction of a doctor and more nursing supervision is required, but CNAs and LPNs provide the majority of the hands-on care. You can go to the next slide. So nursing facilities often cost around 10,000 a month, sometimes more. A nursing facility may be private pay or covered under long-term care insurance. Alternatively, if an individual does not have the resources to pay for their nursing care, then long-term care Medicaid is an option. And if someone is at the facility short-term for rehab, then the payer source may be Medicare. You can go to the next slide. So these are just some websites that may assist you in your search, and you can always contact our intake line if you have questions. We always recommend you visit a facility if possible at two different times, and if not, communicate with staff by phone. And then we have tips for advocates and checklists for what to consider when visiting both assisted living facilities and nursing facilities, which I believe Juliana can provide or has already provided. You can go to the next slide. These are just some issues to consider when visiting a facility. It's important to pay attention to if residents are dressed appropriately, do they look well-groomed, also look for the cleanliness of the facility and watch for positive interactions between the staff and the residents. You can go ahead to the next slide, then you can skip again. And then you can skip one more. So these are just different resources for advocating. One resource is our program, the Ombudsman Program. Another resource is the Department of Social Services for Assisted Living Facilities, or the Department of Health Office of Licensure and Certification for Nursing Facilities, Home Health, or Adult Day Healthcare, and then of course, Adult Protective Services. You can go to the next slide. This is just a sample of the resident rights. As I said earlier, the resident rights are a cornerstone of our program. You can go to the next slide. And if you'd be, like to subscribe to our newsletter, this is how you subscribe and it has the um, directions on there. You can go to the next slide. And the last slide is our contact information. We are also housed in Panino building and our intake line is up there as well if you'd ever like to reach out to us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, I just want to remind everyone, we will have time to answer questions. Um, so please go ahead and use the Q&A box. We will get to your questions. Um, and lastly, we have Denise Pitts who will provide an overview of the um, legal services in Northern Virginia. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. My name is Denise Pitts. I'm a, an attorney at Legal Services of Northern Virginia. This is actually our 41st year um, that we're celebrating. 
Uh, we're a nonprofit organization, and our goal is to help people in the community um, access justice. Um, services are provided on a scale, um, you know, low income first, um, and we go from there. Um, we get a lot, as you can imagine, since our services are free, they're completely free um, to our clients. We get a lot of requests for assistance. Um, we get over 13,000, almost 14,000 requests. Um, the numbers is a little bit misleading. The total number of people helped. We count the number of people within a family. So that's why, um, I mean, it looks like we take every case that we get if you look at these numbers, but um, that's not actually the case. We have to be very mindful of our resources and where we apply them, but we do have a very vibrant elder law practice. Next slide. Um, we, as you can see, um, the most uh, cases we do are in domestic violence areas. Um, and senior cases are second or third. Um, some of the disabled person cases are also um, senior cases and some of the domestic violence cases are senior cases. I actually do a lot of protective orders um, for seniors. Next slide. So um, we have primary service areas, we have offices, in Arlington, Fairfax, Prince William, Loudoun County, and Alexandria. I'm in the Fairfax office and I am the elder law attorney. All of the other jurisdictions and offices have an elder law attorney. Um, you can see we offer legal services like almost all the way down to um, Spotsylvania, to Richmond County almost. Um, so uh, that's a lot of people requesting a lot of services and um, we do what we can to help. Next slide. Um, so uh, some of the legal remedies that I as an elder law attorney am called upon to assist with are involuntary discharges from nursing homes. And, and I'll give a shout out to Kristen and the Ombudsman program. Um, they're a huge help with involuntary discharges, and that's when a person is asked to leave either a nursing home um, or other skilled facility um, for non-payment, for criminal activity. Um, there's a lot of different reasons people can be asked to leave. Um, the, the process for discharging someone involuntary is very, very complicated. And I will say, generally, the skilled nursing facilities don't get it quite right the first time, but they're liable to try again and again. So um, a lot of times I can help buy time um, while we work out a move out agreement or something like that. I do protective orders, I do wills, um, I do general powers of attorney, um, I'll assist with any issue that anyone over the age of 60 brings to me. Next slide. Next slide. So we have a um, very broad practice area. We do domestic violence, family law, education, child advocacy, public benefits, housing, consumer tax, and unemployment claims. In the elder law area, I personally do wills, advanced medical directives, powers of attorney, nursing home discharges, and everything or anything else a client or an applicant over the age of 60 can bring to me. Um, and again, because of the grant that we get from Fairfax County, I'm able to meet with anyone over the age of 60, regardless of income. Um, just a disclaimer, uh, I might meet with someone over the age of 60 who is concerned about the um, platinum prongs to a three carat diamond ring failing, and that applicant is going to get 
um, some education on legal processes and um, how the legal system works, but I'm going to save most of my firepower for a more serious case where someone's facing homelessness or a nursing home discharge. Next slide. What do we not, what does LSMV not do? We don't do traffic, traffic cases. We don't do criminal cases. We don't do any class action cases. Uh, we will sometimes do fee generating cases and that's more, um, we see that as more in, in the area of consumer law where we're, um, the law provides that we can get attorney's fees. It's a complicated process to accept those kind of cases. Um, so we just gen generally, you know, we decide on a case by case basis and we don't represent undocumented immigrants who are not victims of abuse or trafficking. Next slide. Um, how do we do the work? You call in, you can call, you can go online or you can apply for in person for our services. This slide shows how to apply by the different um, methods. As a general rule, I would say our senior population likes to apply on the phone. They don't have a lot of confidence in the online process, although it's, um, it works very well. Um, you call in and the intake process is about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, you answer a lot of questions. Your legal issue is identified and you're assigned a interview with a case handler. And that just means with an attorney. Um, and then you'll meet, the, the client will meet with the attorney, will take the case to case acceptance and determine whether or not it's an appropriate use of our limited resources mm -hmm. and proceed from there. Next slide. Um, how do we do the work? Um, we have regularly scheduled appointments. I do all my new appointments on Tuesday. I will um, work on the weekend or at night if, you know, if someone's schedule requires that kind of accommodation. Um, after I meet with a client or an applicant, I'll take that case to case acceptance where all the attorneys discuss the case and discuss the resources available um, and decide whether or not we're going to take it for full representation, limited services, or advice. Next slide. Yeah, so that's Legal Services of Northern Virginia. Uh, I look forward to any questions you'll have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. That was very, very helpful. Um, so let's start this conversation. Um, let me start with Allison. Allison, what is the role of adult protective services in addressing elder abuse and neglect in long-term care settings? And I, you, I know you, you kind of talked a little bit about it, but I wonder if you could uh, give us a little more information. Sure. Um, so when we look into a abuse allegations in facilities, we're looking at, um, you know, really gathering information, meeting with the individual, um, their family, facility staff, um, obtaining facility records, reviewing those, and trying to make the best assessment that we can um, on how to make recommendations. We also would look to, you know, partner with Kristen, the ombudsman, um, as well as licensing in the Department of Health if, if concerns are raised um, for residents' rights issues. Um, if we are looking at the potential for a unsafe discharge, you know, again, connecting with Denise and her group if there's a concern there. Um, so really this panel is to really partner in a lot of ways um, when, when the situation arises. Um, but most of all, you know, really looking to see what issue happened, what things can we promote for change to better the client and their outcome. Thank you. Denise, what are some type of legal documents that a family caregiver will, will have to have in place to, to be able to place a loved one in a long-term care facility and to advocate for that person? And also kind of a follow-up to it. Um, is it enough to have a medical power of attorney or does the family caregiver need to be added to a HIPAA consent form? Uh, great question. Um, my, my general advice to everyone, 
um, including every panel member here, every family member, is to execute a general durable power of attorney today. Um, that's the most important estate planning or future um, planning for the future document that you can have. Um, if you if the person has capacity and can execute a general durable power of attorney, um, that's that should be able to take care of all the issues that um, your loved one will be facing and allow an agent or the person holding the power of attorney to act on behalf of the principal, which is the person in the long-term care facility. Um, I also recommend, so we have a general durable power of attorney. I also recommend a medical power of attorney. Um, I recommend a um, living will, um, which is really an advanced medical directive um, outlining what kind of medical intervention your loved one wants in the event of a catastrophic, catastrophic event. Uh, and I've recently um, also started recommending that they get a HIPAA form executed. Um, and if you can get these documents in place, a, a good attorney can do all these documents for you in approximately two hours. Um, if you wait until your loved one has no legal capacity, you're going to have to go through the guardianship procedure, which generally takes about 30 hours of my time. It's a circuit court proceeding. Uh, it's complicated. It's difficult. There's a lot of hoops to jump through. We can do it, um, but it's so much easier to act sooner rather than later. It also can be very emotionally draining for the families to have to go through courts and get that document in place. Yeah. And, and it's intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are very intimidated to go to circuit court and circuit court, you know, is the highest court we have here in Fairfax. And it's very formal. And um, I know a lot of clients suffer a lot of anxiety as those hearing dates approach. Yeah. And a power of attorney, you're just sitting in my office watching me type. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. Uh, my next question is going to be for Kristen. Uh, Kristen, even before the pandemic, staffing in long-term care facilities was a challenge. Um, and we know that it has been worse during this pandemic. Uh, are there any estate mandated staffing ratios for nursing homes, assisted living facilities, or, or memory care facilities? And how does it impact care, the care that people receive? That is a good question, and it's a question that's asked frequent, frequently. And the only mandated staffing ratio is in memory care, and that is one staff for every 10 residents. There are no staffing ratios in the regular assisted living or nursing facilities. The regulations are purposefully broad, which often leads to a different interpretation or even misinterpretation which could negatively affect care greatly. The regulations are worded in such a way though that facilities should have appropriate staffing levels and adequate staff to meet the needs of their residents. So facilities with residents that have higher acuity levels should have more staff. And residents who are on special equipment such as a ventilator may need more assistance. If there were mandated minimum staffing levels, the concern is that facilities would only hire the minimum number of staff. And in general, the regulations are meant to be the bare minimum of care that is required. It's also important that staff receive appropriate training to meet resident needs. And there's a consistency in staff and assignments, particularly with residents who may be cognitively impaired. And we have noticed that some facilities have had issues hiring staff recently. But overall, it, it is very important to have self-advocacy, family advocacy, legislative advocacy, and advocacy organizations. These are all very valuable to advocate for improved staffing and therefore quality of life and care of residents. 
Yeah, thank you. And I guess very important for, for the family member who is thinking about the uh, placement to visit this specific group. Kind of Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Alison, um, what are some of the warning signs of elder abuse and neglect in a long-term care setting? Uh, what should family caregivers be looking for? Sure. So some of the things I mentioned earlier that are on the the list um, provided on there is a lot of information, but really some of the bigger ones are kind of the more obvious to uh, a layman um, per se would be, you know, you know your family member best um, if you've been caring for them for some time. So you know when things aren't right. Um, so really looking for those changes in behavior. Um, you know, if there's somebody who always got up in the morning to read the newspaper and that was a pattern that was very important to them and have that cup of coffee and that's how they start their day and they just start to withdraw from those things. Um, you know, it could be that they're still adjusting to the facility. It could be that they're uncomfortable or that maybe they enjoyed going out into the room or the community room or the cafe to have that meal and maybe something happened and they want to recluse and be in their room. So really just looking for those changes that you know of that person. Um, the other one is looking at, you know, dehydration, malnutrition, um, and kind of a lot of these things can start to snowball into each other. Things like if you notice changes of their personality, um, to some extent, it could be a cognitive issue that is happening and unreversible, but this could also be something where maybe they have a urinary tract infection, you know, maybe they have delirium, um, or maybe it's depression. And so really trying to, you know, communicate with the facility when you're seeing those changes and asking, you know, hey, I think something's going on, you know, I think my mom may have a UTI, can we, can we test her for one? Um, you know, looking to get that clarification on Am I seeing a change or is something else going on? Um, things like foul odor, significant dramatic weight loss or weight gain. Um, it could be a fluid retention issue or it could be something where they're not getting the appropriate support that they need. Maybe they have a dental issue and the facility's not addressing it. And so it's leading to a nutritional value issue. Um, so a lot of things kind of snowballing in together. Um, wandering behaviors, not providing adequate uh, secured unit or alternatives for activities. Um, a lot of things could be just change of environment, but it's always good to have that connection, like Kristen mentioned about having advocacy. Um, you know, you know your family member best. Thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions from our audience and I wanna make sure we have enough time to get to those questions. So how about if we kind of go over some of those questions? Um, we have a question from Mary. It says regarding visitation at nursing home facilities, does that vary among facilities or is there a specific guidance uh, or guide, a specific guideline that all facilities must follow? Um, this question might go to Kristen. Okay. So um, that question depends a lot on the COVID restrictions right now. Prior to COVID, um, visitation was very different. It was much more open. Um, in assisted living facilities, they had to provide um, access 24-7 for visitation. But then with COVID, a lot changed in terms of visitation. As we all know, visitation was first. Um, completely cut off for all the facilities except in compassionate care situations. And now we have started to see that visitation come back and it's looked different in the different facilities. So um, visitation has returned now for the most part. A lot of facilities are requiring the family members to schedule visits at a certain time or they're limiting the number of visitors they can have in the building at one time but um, some facilities are completely open so it really does depend right now on um, the different facilities policy and i know with the variant picking back up um, visitation may become restricted again but we're hoping that visitation will go back soon to being open for family members because i know it has been very difficult thank you so the next question the next question comes from jan uh, and this is for denise uh, will you clarify if a family member has the advanced directive for health care for a sibling does one need to get a medical power of attorney so um Without seeing the actual document, it's kind of hard to speak to what they have or don't have. 
um, a medical power of attorney generally just lists um, different medical authority that the holder would have. Um, the uh, advanced medical directive is more of a final wishes in the event that um, the person is in a vegetative state. Um, it's also called a living, uh, living will um, and outlines whether or not the uh, principal wants um, heroic measures and, and medical treatments in the event that they are in a vegetative state. Um, so you can generally, if you can try to wade through um, the document, if the document's talk, talking about hydration, food, and resuscitation, then it's generally going to be a living will or an advanced medical directive. If it's talking about medical procedures and medications, then it's going to be a medical power of attorney. And whoever drafted the document should be able to answer any questions. Feel free to go back to that attorney um, and say, like, this is what I think I have. Am I right? And or do I need an, a different document? Do I need the advanced medical directive or the living will? The next question is for you as well, Denise. Um, can a resident of an assisted living facility be allowed to sign a fina financial power of attorney if that resident has an activated health, has an active healthcare proxy? I hope I read that question correctly. Um, absolutely. Uh, healthcare decisions do not affect um, the financial stuff. So they can execute a financial document, a financial power of attorney, allowing someone to pay their monthly bills um, or challenge the monthly bills. And they should be, when they are doing those duties um, associated with the power of attorney, they should be treated as though they're standing in the shoes of the principal. Okay, thank you. My next question is for Allison. Allison, who determines whether the individual has capacity? So it would need to be done if they're in a facility or otherwise um, need to be done by a neurologist, a psychologist, psychiatrist, somebody who has that medical degree. Um, a primary care doctor can do it. Um, typically, they, they don't prefer, but if it's somebody who's known that individual for over 20 years and been their physician, they've seen those changes, they may be um, a good person to do it and willing to do it. Um, but if the person is already in a facility, if there is concerns about capacity, um, you know, reaching out to the nurse nurse manager, connecting with them, asking that we get them on the list to be seen by psych so that they can be evaluated appropriately. Um, if it's something where it's before facility placement, you know, really getting that evaluation done um, so that when those plans get in place, just like Denise mentioned about having those in place if they weren't already, um, either con connecting to get that done. If not, then as she also mentioned about conservatorship and guardianship, those things would have to be looked at after the fact. Um, but only only a physician would be able to make that determination. I or other APS workers would not be able to make that decision. Got it. Thank you. So the next question comes from Molly and is for Kristen. What is the difference between assisted living facility and a continuing care retirement community? Why um, why would sorry why would you select one over the other? So a continuing care retirement community uh, typically has independent living, assisted living, and nursing facility level of care. So someone can go into a CCRC when they're in at the independent living stage and then transition from the independent living to assisted living and then go to nursing. So it depends the the Payment is set up differently. You have to check with the individual CCRC to see exactly how it works. And it's really just a matter of preference. I think some individuals like having those different levels of care prearranged for them. So they know, you know, once they progress to an assisted living level of care, they can stay on that same campus, but just move to maybe a different room or a different building. And then same with nursing. They have that nursing bed available if they do need it. 
and then assist no go ahead i was just going to say assisted living is you know standalone assisted living only mm -hmm. so actually the next question um it might be for kristen and also denise i don't know you, either of you could re um, answer it says what cautions should we be aware of when we have to complete an alf contract assisted living facility contract so um, Denise, I can start off and then defer to you, but I would just say read the contract in its entirety because there's a lot of really important information in there and you definitely want to know what you're signing. Usually the contract is a very thick document, but I would say take the time, read it cover to cover to know what you are signing, what the fees are. It's very important. And Denise, I don't know if you want to add more to that. Um, the the one thing um, the one thing I would uh, flag for anyone listening is um, obviously Kristen's advice is stellar. You sh you really do need to read the contract, and um, something that the contract sometimes doesn't address is the cost of living increase, um, which is generally as high. It can be as high as ten percent annually. And that varies wildly from facility to facility. Um, so it may be that you, can, you think you have things in place through long-term care insurance or other um, funds to keep your loved one in the same place. But um, all too often, I see that those cost of living increases end up necessitating a move. And if you've ever moved a loved one into any type of facility you'll know how difficult a process it is for the loved one um, and i'm an advocate of moving them the least number of times possible so check the cost of living thank you denise um, there is a question that goes to you as well how does a dpoa document get activated for example when someone loses capacity how do you go about taking over it if you are that dpoa you just start um, i will offer a disclaimer um, there are two types of general durable powers of attorney one is a springing power of attorney, and that will spring into existence upon um, the happening of an event. Like, if what I see most often is that someone loses capacity, and then the principal, the person that loses capacity, wants it to spring into effect, and there's going to have to be two written notes from a doctor saying that person no longer has capacity i do not like springing powers of attorney it almost negates the usefulness of a um, currently effective power of attorney and by currently effective i mean the moment you finish executing it and notarizing it it's effective and also know that just because a power of attorney is currently effective doesn't mean that your agent or your co-agents are gonna start exercising it. Um, they, I mean, years may go by before they need to step into the shoes of the loved one. And it can be executed intermittently. I mean, it can be used intermittently. So maybe one month your loved one is in the hospital and you can just start paying the bills. And when you execute the power of attorney, you should get um, instructions on how to sign using the power of attorney and i'll let you in on a secret um, you sign by say if your loved one is john doe you sign john john doe by jane doe comma attorney in fact so don't ever sign just john or john doe or jane doe if you sign john doe they're not going to accept it because that person no longer has capacity if you sign by your own name, you could be legally liable for expenses incurred by your loved one. So be very careful. 
That's great to know. Thank you. And actually, my next question has to do with capacity, and it goes to Alison. Alison, what is the role of capacity of the person in an investigation? And what happens when that person doesn't have capacity? And he or she might be in a memory care facility. So we will still meet with that person regardless. We want to meet with the individual, especially if, you know, for example, if it's a abuse or neglect allegation, we want to see that person. We want to see if there's the injury that's reported to the body, if there is that significant amount of weight loss. So that element of capacity in that moment doesn't matter. Um, but things like wanting to gather information from the facility so we can make a better assessment. Is this somebody who just got a dementia diagnosis? Is it somebody who's had it for many years and it's very advanced? Um, that when speaking with them, they're changing topics. We don't have a way to understand them. So we ourselves are able to report back, you know, and reflect in our notes of how this person presents to us. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, looking at is this depression, is this delirium, is this dementia, really teasing out is it something that is reversible or not? Um, because they can look very similar. If, if you were to ever Google search the three of those, there's a lot of similarities between them, how they manifest, um, but also some can be reversed and some can't. Um, again, looking at the person's ability to recall, maybe they do have some issues with memory, but in other spheres, they're able to recall certain things. Um, you know, a lot of times if there's a emotional attachment to the event, there's fear. Um, even in some of those situations where a person may have diminished capacity um, or memory impairment, they still may cower and, you know, move away from that person. So we still may be able to gather information from those interactions. Um, but ultimately, if there is an incapacity and they do have a guardian or they do have a power of attorney, we're going to connect with that person as far as making recommendations and working with that person to make sure that the client in need is getting the support that they need. Um, and that person is going to be able to put those plans into motion. Um, so really looking at, you know, the balance of how do they present, what information can they actually reflect and share with us, and then connecting with those responsible parties. And ultimately, if there isn't a responsible party, then we are looking to see what needs to be done so they have that person that can speak for them when they cannot. Thank you so much, Alison. And we are at the end of the hour. It went by very, very quickly. But there's one last question that I want to place to um, Kristen, and I hope um, you all can stay with us for a few more minutes. Um, Kristen, is there any public reporting database where people can find any compliance reports on long-term care facilities? Yes. So the Virginia Department of Social Services website provides information on compliance reports for assisted living facilities. And if you go on that website and you search by facility name, you can find an inspection history of the different assisted living facilities. And the website lists the phone number for the licensing inspector as well. And under the facility description, it lists the inspection date, whether it was complaint related and if there were violations. And it also includes the regulatory areas reviewed, any comments by the inspector, along with a plan of correction. And then the Medicare.gov Healthcare Compare website provides inspection information for nursing facilities. And it provides general information about the facility, including the number of certified beds and if they participate in Medicare or Medicaid. The website also assigns facilities an overall rating, as well as a rating for health inspections, staffing, and quality of resident care. And if you go to that website and you click on view inspection results, it will go into more detail about the date of inspection and number of citations. And um, the Virginia Department of Health also has something similar for nursing facilities. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for all your answers and for your expertise and for being here with us today. I know that one hour is really not enough to get through all of your questions, but I hope you found this conversation helpful and that we were able to address key aspects when considering long-term care placement. Uh, we will have a second part of this conversation and it'll be on aging in place. So hopefully you can join us then. Um, we know that aging in place is not always feasible for everyone, and when that happens, we want to be here uh, supporting our community through education and services that, so that you can make an informed decision. Um, 
I also want to invite you to fill out our survey because it really helped us to know what you thought of today's conversation. It also helped us to plan for future topics that you might want to learn about. Um, and I want to uh, end and today's conversation by thanking all of you, our, our panelists and our audience uh, for your time and for participating. And thank you so much. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.